do you think, well, you know, this is a story that was probably passed down, oral tradition before it was written down, and, you know, we expand things when we tell them. So the story is maybe just a little inflated. Is this truly a case of the extraordinary power of God? A true miracle, what some might disparagingly or not call magic. As Jesus go hocus pocus and poof, there's bread for everybody. And does the way you think about the story change the way that influences how you think about God? If you hold one of the traditional views that the feeding of the 5,000 is told in all of the different gospel narratives, it's really a matter of Little boy has lunchbox, shows he's generous. Everyone else goes, well, I actually have some bread in my coat, too. And all of a sudden, there's enough bread for everyone because people share. The generosity causes the feeding. Well, that is a very different understanding of God than Jesus going to hocus pocus. How we think about these stories matters. And I wish I could tell you I have a perfect explanation for how it all works. But that would be why. And I try really hard not to do that. Because I figure if I'm wearing the collar, that attracts lightning. <laughs> <laughs> or so says my wife. <laughs> my approach probably draws a little more gasps here, from our Greek Orthodox brethren. I may have given this explanation before, but it's what I like so much it bears repeating. When we talk about the sacraments, baptism and communion, we base our terminology on the Latin sacramentum. Our Orthodox friends rely, rather, on, not surprisingly, the Greek, mysterium literally translates, it's a mystery. I think when we come to miracles in the gospel, when we come to passages of scripture that defy our understanding, it is not inappropriate or unfaithful to say that sometimes God is mysterious that sometimes God works in a way that we cannot fully comprehend or understand, and that that is okay. That is not to say we should not interrogate and explore the text. That is not to say that we should not seek explanation. But it does free us from the necessity of proving scientifically how bread and fish feed 5,000. As an aside, I took my own challenge when I was reading the text this morning, and I noticed something. Did you notice that when Jesus says, gather up the fragments so that nothing may be lost, the text says they gathered up the fragments of the barley loaves. It says nothing about the fish. <laughs> Maybe they just don't want leftover fish. I don't know. Because <laughs> I never noticed that before. There's 12 baskets of bread. Maybe the fish was just really good. I don't know. There you are. That has nothing to do with the rest of the story. <laughs> but I find interesting things when I say them. Um, but that idea of being able and willing to embrace a little bit of mystery, boy, that rubs some of our reformed leanings the wrong way sometimes. Because we want to understand. That's very Presbyterian, wanting to understand. Understanding is you know, decent and in order. We like that. But I think when we allow a sense of mystery, it allows us to look at something else in the story. Some things that we might miss otherwise. <coughs> because if we're so focused on how do bread and fish feed 5,000 people, what kind of a miracle is this? 
then we miss other things. And there are three, this is very Princeton, there are three things that I want to look at. <laughs> three bits of context, three details that I think bring an interesting texture to this story. They help us interpret what is happening, and more importantly, they help us learn something about God. They help us learn something about the person of Jesus Christ, who is the embodiment of the one that created everything. So the first detail, early in the story, we hear Jesus went up to the mountain and sat down. And just before they look up to see the crowd coming, the, the narrator of this story tells us that it was the Passover and that the festival was near. So why is this important? It could just be simply a, uh, a marker of time so we know at what point in the year this is happening. It's Passover, it's springtime. That could be the only detail, but I think there's more than that. What happens during the Passover? What is important during the Passover? Family, going to your home. During the Passover, Jewish folks will go to great lengths to be with their family. Folks would be making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. The city is getting filled with pilgrims, people from all over the country go. It is like Thanksgiving here nowadays. People will go to great lengths to be at home for the turkey and the stuffing. In our story, people would go to great lengths to be home for the Passover meal. But Jesus is on the side of the mountain in desolate country. And there are thousands who have no home to go to. Thousands who would rather go sit at the foot of an itinerant preacher. And this is early in his ministry. Thousands show up. Thousands that haven't made the trek to Jerusalem. Thousands that aren't with their family aren't in a safe home. Now maybe that's reading a little bit into it. We don't know the story of each of those that comes to sit at the feet of Jesus, but we can safely assume that at least the majority of this crowd are people that feel excluded and unwanted in traditional settings. These are the people who don't come to our Christmas Eve services because they feel they don't have a place here. You might also note that means Jesus is not in Jerusalem for the Passover. He's not in church either. He's out feeding those who are unexpected. And where does he feed them? We are told Another one of these details that comes out of the blue, Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in this place. They sit down in the green pasture. Hmm, that reminds me of something. What does that remind you of? The green pasture it makes me lay down. The green pasture. 23rd Psalm. The Lord, my shepherd, makes me lay down in a green pasture and lays a table before me. The Lord calling the unexpected, the unwanted, to a place of safety, a place of haven, where against all expectations they are fed. We focus on how the feeding happens and we miss who is fed, and maybe why. The final detail is this word that shows up twice at the end of the, the passage about the feeding of the 5,000, and then again at the end of this little, very short snippet about a boat, a 
storm. We don't get, this is different than the other storm narratives that the Gospels tell. It's over very quickly and it's tapped on to the end of the feeding narrative and so it can be easy to kind of just brush it aside. But the end of both, we're told, they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. And then the disciples wanted to take him into the boat. And in both cases, Jesus doesn't allow himself to be forced into human plans. He goes off by himself onto a mountain. Immediately the boat reaches its destination before the disciples can do any taking. But I think the center of the text lies in what Jesus says to the disciples in the boat. It is I do not be afraid. For the presence of Christ frees us from fear. It fears us from our fears of being excluded from the community. It fear, frees us from our fears of being stuck in a place that is barren. It frees us from our fear of danger, of storms. It replaces it with welcome and abundance and a safe haven and arrival. Our God is a God of abundance. In the world of Jesus Christ, there is always enough. Not just for those that are assumed to be family, but for those that have been excluded, those who have been forgotten and pushed to the outskirts, those who don't even bother to make the trek to Jerusalem. Out in the mountains, they find themselves in the presence of Christ. I think it's a warning for us who so easily think that Christ is always with us, for he is. But are we more likely to find him here or living in a tiny house in Eden Village? I know where I'd spend my time. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.